Thank, thank you very much, Simon. Thanks for those kind words, and thank you all for being here. Uh, so uh, we had uh, no slides moving, so what do I need to do? Probably turn it on first. There we go. Okay. Um, we wrote this book, as Simon said, um, um, that came out in early 08 about the changes that uh, millennials would drive in American politics. And then uh, the election happened pretty much uh, in uh, alignment with what we said in the book. And our uh, editor asked us to do a afterword for a paperback edition that is now out. And um, we sort of take about 9,000 words in that afterward to say we told you so. So I don't know how exciting the chapter is, but it is an attempt to look at why Obama won and what kind of lessons one might derive from that outcome that are important not just for politicians and political campaigns where a lot of the focus is, but for governing America and leading America. Um, if you listen to the Republican Party's explanation of the 2008 election, it generally says, well, everything was fine, and then the stock market crashed, and McCain fell behind, and that was the end of it. And that, uh, that election reminds me of somebody who, when asked, uh, why is it daylight outside, said the sun came up. I mean, yeah, it's obviously part of the answer, and it may be a good surface answer, but it fails to even begin to describe what was actually going on and why that uh, meltdown of Wall Street, the, day, the week that Wall Street died is the way Wall Street Journal uh, captures it, the September 15th all the way through the 18th, 19th of September. Why did that have the impact on the electorate that it did, and why was the election already headed in a direction of victory for Obama that that event sort of just underlined? And our answer in the afterward is, of course, that the that week was the triggering event for the next civic era of America. And we had talked earlier in uh, realignment theory about how every 40 years or so, America changes its political allegiances in terms of majority support for a particular party. And when we started, we used to have a question mark over there on 08. Now we can put the first blue bar up of what we suspect will be many. Um, but when we talked about that, we said that you need some kind of crisis, some kind of significant external event in order to break the dam that is holding back the forces of change that are building before a realignment occurs. And in this particular case, that week was that triggering event. But what happens is that most people spend all their time, as the Republicans are doing, talking about the triggering event instead of the underlying trends of what actually is going on it's sort of like the dam broke. Yeah, but there was a lot of water behind the dam, and it's now flooded everything, and what's this water all about? It's kind of important to understand that. And what we said in our basic theory of the book was that these realignments occur every 40 years as a result of a rise of a large new civic generation, very dynamic, not always a civic generation, a large dynamic generation, and a new communication technology that allows them to be mobilized almost without understanding by the rest of the country who may or may not be involved in that communication technology. Obviously, there's no big insight to say now that in 2008, that was the millennial generation, those 27 and under, uh, and who uh, voted for uh, President Obama uh, two to one, and the uh, social networks that they used to mobilize themselves. Back when we wrote the book, we could say that by saying MySpace, YouTube. These days, you'd have to say Facebook, Twitter, and God knows what else. Uh, but it's all the same idea. It's a different way of communicating peer-to-peer, -peer, not top-down, not broadcast, not controlled messaging. And in this case, as in previous realignments, those changes cause significant different, uh, uh, differences in electoral results, which we've already seen, voting behavior, which we've already seen, and public policy, which we're just about to see. So people say, well, so what's going to happen? So first thing we would do is recommend you read your history books. We spend some time capturing some of that uh, in, in our book, but obviously there's more to be said. Uh, this is actually the fourth. We are now living through the fourth civic realignment in American history. My co-author, Mike Hayes, who is a political scientist, has a PhD to prove it, um, 
his contribution to the literature is really in this book, in the sense that while political realignment theory has been around for a while, nobody until Mike has, uh, has clearly doc documented that there are really two different types of realignment, one civic-minded, one ideologically oriented, based upon the two different types of generations from Strauss and Howe's theories of generational cycles. And so even though it happens every 40 years, these civic generations only come around every 80 years. And so if you're looking for American history analogs, you would need to go back 80 years and then 80 years again to the days of FDR and Lincoln. They do, however, reflect um, very well what we are likely to see in the way of political debates going forward. Um, the problem everybody has right now, at least not everybody, but many people have, in trying to understand what, when history is happening right in front of you, is the analogs they reach for are either Reagan or, in some more insightful cases, the Nixon realignment of 1968. And say, so see, this is how it went. Well, yes, that is how that it, idealist era realignment went. It has very little to do with civic era realignments. And there are, there is very little polling data that extends prior to 1964, 1968. And most of the methodologies before that weren't so great. So a lot of the polling data that does exist is somewhat suspect. And so you'll see a lot of polling uh, results analyzed over a 40-year time frame, which is all inside a previous ideological era, not a civic era. So without polls, but with some historical analogies, there are still lessons to be learned uh, from this civic era. What you need to realize is the challenges are almost identical between the challenges that FDR and, and Lincoln faced. Um, they took their political parties out of an electoral wilderness. In Lincoln's case, the very first time his political party won a national election, hadn't been long, around long enough to win many others. They were obviously in the middle of some of the worst crises the country's ever faced. I know there's a lot of conversation now about how bad the economy is. I like to call it the Great Recession to make sure people know it isn't a depression, uh, but it's bad. Um, uh, and as a consequence of being given that crisis to deal with, they actually significantly revitalized and expanded national political institutions. So America in 1868 had very little resemblance to the America of 1848. The America of 1940 bore almost no relationship in how our economy was organized, the role of the federal government, the nature of population and work and life as compared to 1920. And when President Obama finishes his second term in 2016, this country will look nothing like the America of 1996 that we're so familiar with. Because you have this complete generational and technological change that will change our politics among many, many other things. Um, by the way, if you're wondering about current events at all in this context, the uh, latest political surveys from Pew on millennials show that they support uh, the Obama administration's economic program, 5439, and, excuse me, uh, 6329, and when asked whether there should be more government control over the economy, or a smaller government, millennials are in favor of more government control over the economy by a 54 to 39 percent margin. So you have these kinds of current debates about where things ought to go, but the millennials are as solidly supportive of the president's policies as they were of his campaign. Okay, one last thing on FDR and Lincoln, then we'll get to the 2008 election. It is, if you read the history books, eerie as to how much of a similarity there is between the political commentary of today and the political commentary of those days. When not yet President Lincoln in 1856 ran for office, he talked in the campaign at one point about the, the, the impossibility of a country that was half slave and half free existing. 
and his campaign advisors pulled him aside and said, don't use that line. That'll, you'll sound like an agitator who's trying to dissolve the union. So, you know, pull back from that rhetoric and that sort of futuristic, apocalyptic, apocalyptic vision. And um, he did for a couple of years. And then in 1858, when he entered the historic debates with Senator, uh, uh, sorry, Douglas, I always go Stevens, it's Stephen Douglas. When he entered into the debates with Senator Douglas, um, he told his same campaign advisor, same back then they wouldn't have been called campaign advisors, uh, that, he was, that he had settled on the main argument he was going to make in those debates. And it was that um, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And they all said, what, are you crazy? I mean, you know, this is, this, you know, you'll never win. You'll never win. Well, of course, he did not win that campaign, but he did win the debate. He did win the presidency. One advisor told him, you know, if you use that line, I don't think you should. You'll probably be president of the United States. And so it was that ability to express a vision of the future and stick to it that made him one of our greatest, if not the greatest presidents. And of course, many of you may not know that when FDR articulated a new deal for the forgotten man, it was roundly opposed by most of the Democrats of that era as inciting class warfare. Where have we heard those lines before, right? And so you hear conversations about Obama's trying to do too much, the blueprint, the budget blueprint is, way, is overly ambitious, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And all we look at and say is, yes, and in eight years when America is completely different, people will go back to that blueprint and say, here's where it all started, a new era of responsibility. So those are the historical uh, analogies we can give you. The, um, the campaign analogy that we think is relevant to governing goes to something that we call in the book the four M's of politics, which are message, messenger, m media, and money. That, to get, that working synergistically together uh, create a campaign and, uh, and a winning campaign. And in the book, we try and explain how far off a civic era set of four M's the Republicans allowed themselves to get and how interestingly uh, early Obama was in adopting this civic era set of four M's. So I'm going to let Mike do most of this, but let me just take you through message and then we'll show you where that goes and how it leads to the population. So first of all, the message that uh, Obama was delivering, as you all know, was oh, unity and hope. And the message from the Republicans, which had worked successfully for 40 years, was division and fear. And every time the campaign sort of went off in a direction that the Republicans didn't like, they'd try and come up with some new division and fear message in the hopes that it would work. And it never took, and they couldn't understand why. If they had read the results of the 06 election, in many congressional districts, that same strategy failed where it worked before. It certainly didn't work in 08. And that's because it's an ideological or idealist era message. It's not a civic era message. What civic era messages are about are getting rid of the divisive personal morality and culture of the prior years. So the rebellion is not against institutions, as some of you boomers may have remembered. It's against the culture and a desire to have a more unified culture, which post-campaign, not in the campaign, Obama has called the era of responsibility, and that's as good a name as any for something that's more about mutual concern as opposed to greed and individualism. But greed and individualism are popular in ideological eras. They just don't work in civic eras. And when the civic era arrived with the collapse of, the, of Wall Street, the message was way off course for the Republicans. They couldn't get back. The other thing that happens in civic eras is that there's a great deal of focus on economics and economic inequality in particular. Um, the uh, uh, idea of social issues, which is a, one piece of a divisive, divisive and fear message, what, you pick the name of the issue, whether it's you know, on the social issue side, whether you're trying to divide people around immigration questions, as the Republicans thought they would in 08, or, or in abortion or other kinds of debates of that kind, they don't work, they don't work in civic eras. Uh, prohibition was repealed within the first year of FDR's administration. The wet-dry debate that kept the Democrats from nominating a candidate for 120 ballots in the 1920s disappeared 
and basically because as the people booing Herbert Hoover at the opening day of the ball game said, we want beer. I mean, it's a tough economic environment and you're just not interested in those kinds of lesser level um, uh, questions. So what happens in civic eras is that the primacy of the federal government is enhanced over states' rights and to some degree over individual rights. There's a great deal of direction, strong direction from, D from Washington on what should be done. And you get the creation of new institutions. And I can tick off a few of the ones that the campaign foreshadowed and you're now seeing come into, into, into play. I suspect the biggest one ultimately in, in changing America will be national service. Yesterday, I think the House passed the increase, the significant increase in national service uh, uh, resources, but it's only the beginning of what will be a major effort and we, in our opinion, will ultimately lead to mandatory national service as part of American society. Uh, but you'll also hear, again, not always focused upon the conversations on education and how we need to reform American education. In civic eras, educational reform has been a central part of the political agenda. Lincoln's Moral College, Moral Act, uh, the Moral Act in Lincoln's day established land grant colleges, the GI Bill in, in, after World War II, those are always doing that. And then um, you also get a shift. Uh, so those are a couple institutions, a couple others you can talk about, and the National Net Roots Organization driven from Washington is potentially another. Here's a poll from October of 2008 in comparison to 81 and 91 on what people are looking for in civic eras. Uh, you have uh, this gigantic rise from 18% in 81 to 45% by October of, eight, of 2008 on agreement that there is too little regulation of business. In fact, three quarters of the people believe that lack of regulation caused the financial crisis, making uh, any uh, of the prior era's economic theories um, suspect and, and really uh, no longer credible. And then finally, in, in civic eras on the message side, we've shown this slide before, but when Joe the plumber suggested that uh, Obama was in favor of sharing the wealth and redistributing income and maybe a socialist, most of the country said, good. And it was a very popular economic message to have, and it will be in civic eras. Even today, the tax, part, the tax cuts and tax raises parts of the Obama budget are the most popular aspects of his proposals. And so you're going to get a lessening of economic inequality, which happens in every civic era, as a result of, of that popular support. And then, of course, the final stage of the campaign, McCain suggested that since Obama was doing well, the country was really in danger of electing a Democratic Congress and a Democratic president, and that would be a really terrible thing. And most of the people, when asked, 59% of them said, that would actually be a good thing. And so the notion that divided government is something the public wants is true in, ideal, in idealist eras. It is not true in civic eras, and it's the wrong argument to make. Basically, there wasn't a policy position or message position that the Republicans took in the 2008 campaign that wasn't based on an old playbook. Obama would call it old politics. We would call it idealist era politics, and it was all wrong for that particular campaign. But it wasn't just the message that carried the day. It was the other three M's as well. I think Mr. Hayes needs to get up here and talk to you about some of that. Although this is not meant to be a picture of President Obama. <laughs> 